welcome to Season 2 of Inflammation Nation. My name is Gráinne O'Leary. Inflammation Nation is a podcast from Arthritis Ireland, aimed at increasing awareness and understanding of arthritis and related conditions. It's my great pleasure to be joined today by Professor Frank Barry. Uh, Professor Frank Barry is a Professor of Cellular Therapy at the University of Galway and a Principal Investigator at the Regenerative Medicine Institute, Remedy. Here he directs a large group of researchers who focus on the development of new repair strategies in stem cell therapy and gene therapy in orthopaedics. He's contributed to the fields of tissue engineering and regenerative medicine by developing innovative and successful cellular therapies for tissue repair, joint injury and arthritic disease. You're very welcome, Frank, and thank you for joining us today. Thank you very much. It's great to be here. Um, I'm going to start by asking you um, about, I suppose, taking you back to maybe your maybe your childhood or your schooling and what was it that sparked that first interest in science that maybe led you to pursuing a career in this area? Um, to be honest, I always had a strong interest in science and especially life sciences and biology. And probably the beginning of that for me was when I was a kid and, you know, wildlife and bird watching and an interest in animals was what sparked that uh, that, that that pursuit, which I then went on to continue and made a career out of it. Out of it. So you started off, did you start off with doing a science degree? Is that Yeah, I did a science degree. Um, my, uh, I had to, got a degree in biochemistry and then I went on to do a master's and a PhD also in biochemistry. And so that was where it all started. Then after my PhD, I went to the Kennedy Institute of Rheumatology in the UK to do a postdoctoral fellowship and that introduced me to the field of, of, of osteoarthritis research, cartilage repair, cartilage biology, joint diseases and inflammatory arthritis. And so I stepped into that field then and I pretty much stayed in, stayed in the same area um, ever since. Um, along the way, when cell therapy began to um, uh, become a topic of some interest, um, I became involved when I was working in the US and then, you know, the question came up, can we think about cellular therapies as a potential treatment for arthritic diseases? So that took me down that path, which I'm still pursuing today. OK, so we're going to come back to that whole definition of, of sure. the field of, of cellular therapy that you've just mentioned, which is your your special speciality. So can you tell us a little bit about what that is? What does it involve? So cell therapy is a sort of a new principle of treating patients that involves delivering living cells to the patient, either by infusion into the bloodstream or locally to a specific uh, tissue or organ. The idea is that the delivered cells can elicit a repair response or they can um, lead to the formation of repair tissue so that we can think about a number of potential disease treatments um, by the use of, of these cell preparations. Sometimes they're stem cells, sometimes they're adult uh, cells from adult tissues, but the, the whole idea is to regenerate and restore tissues rather than trying to replace them. So is, in that case, are you sort of putting healthy cells yeah. into, into, you know, a joint for perhaps sure. that's damaged. So the idea is that you're, you're putting healthy cells into damaged tissue um, and the healthy cells can come from the patient himself or herself, or they can come from a, a, a another person, a donor. And the, the 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 healthy cells, the idea is that they will repair the damaged tissue, and it could be a joint, for example, it could be the heart, uh, it could be a damaged muscle, and so on. But the idea is that the delivered cells in the cell therapy application, those cells repair the damaged tissue and lead to um, recovery of the patient. Okay, and of, of course, you're, this has been applied in the, in the area of osteoarthritis, mm -hmm. and that's obviously of keen interest, I'm, I'm sure, to many listeners because, you know, osteoarthritis is very prevalent. Um, you know, it's a form of arthritis that's traditionally been difficult to treat. Um, is that one of the main motivations for your work? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, you know, we understand that osteoarthritis is a very prevalent condition. It's probably the most common type of arthritis and it has a huge impact on patients and on their families. It causes a great deal of, of you know, pain and uh, loss of mobility. 
Um, it has a significant economic impact. Um, the healthcare cost associated with treatment of these patients is very significant. Um, and it's as significant as, you know, cardiovascular disease and cancer in terms of its impact on society and on, on patients. But yet, despite all, despite the prevalence of the condition, there is not one treatment which is disease modifying as opposed mm. to symptom modifying. Um, there isn't one treatment that reverses the destruction that happens in the osteoarthritic joint. Um, there isn't any drug, any medication, no therapeutic uh, that can be delivered to stop the degeneration of joint tissues and osteoarthritis. And to me, that was a very striking um, uh, observation that there's this disease which is so prevalent, but yet there are so mm. few therapeutic options. And then when I became aware of the idea of cell therapy, I thought, you know, we have to try this because the potential, if you've got a tissue which is undergoing degeneration and these cells are supposed to be regenerating, then why not put the cells into those um, osteoarthritic joints to see if they'll stimulate a repair response. So that was the motivation mm -hmm. for starting this. And, uh, you know, we're still testing it. Yeah. And, and just to come back to a point you made there about, you know, that there have been no therapies developed to um, I suppose act as a disease modifying agent. Mm -hmm. And of course, huge transformation um, happened in the whole area of inflammatory arthritis yeah. treatments, such as rheumatoid arthritis for the last couple, few decades. And you know, certainly in the people we interact with in, in Arthritis Ireland, we can, we hear, we hear the stories. We, we know it's had a huge impact mm -hmm. on how people, on their, on their quality of life, etc. Why do you think that transformation has never happened in the area of osteoarthritis? Yeah, that's a very good question. So you, you're absolutely right, of course, in the area of, of, of um, rheumatoid arthritis and inflammatory um, uh, conditions, the treatments have been absolutely transformative, you know, dramatic changes in the quality of life of the patients who have received these uh, uh, the, these medications. I think the reason why we haven't seen nearly as much progress in osteoarthritis is because it's actually a much more complex disease. It's a multimodal, multi-symptomatic condition where a large number of different factors contribute to the development of the disease. And there's genetics, there's lifestyle, there's... Um, um, previous injury in the joint. Um, uh, there's there's uh, uh, aspects of mobility and, and use of the joints all contributing to the development of the disease. So the causation of osteoarthritis is much more complex, I think, and therefore the treatments are also uh, much more complex. OK, so let's move on a little bit now to actually talking a little bit about your current, the current research that sure. you're involved in. Um, so can you tell us, um, I, I know so far, you, you've gone through phase one and phase two. So mm -hmm. can you tell us a little bit about that? Of course. And what's happened in those stages? I guess it all started with um, when we started testing cellular therapies for the treatment of osteoarthritis. We did some studies in animals where uh, the animals had arthritic joints and we were able to deliver the cells into these. And there was really quite a dramatic repair response, really quite, quite, quite impressive, um, positive response. And so that led us on to seeking approval to do a, a human study. And we did a phase, what's so-called phase one study, small sort of first preliminary study. Uh, we finished that in 2015. There was uh, 18 patients uh, enrolled. This happened in, in France. And uh, the majority of the patients that received the cell treatment in that early trial had quite a dramatic positive response. Their pain, um, uh, there was a significant reduction in their pain. Uh, their mobility improved uh, after they received the injection of the cells directly into the knee joint. By the way, all of the patients that we're talking about have osteoarthritis of the knee. That's the focus. That's the joint we're focusing on. So the results of that phase one study were really quite promising, even though it was too small to be statistically significant. Um, the real purpose of the phase one study is to make sure that it's safe and that there are no adverse events. Um, because of the results we got in the phase one study, then we applied for approval in Europe to do a phase two study. And uh, we've just literally finished that now. Um, and we're waiting to see the results of that. And did that involve then a greater number of patients yeah, in that phase two? It involved two? a larger number of patients. The target was 150 patients in total would receive, would be enrolled in the trial, in the phase two trial. Because of COVID, things got interrupted in a fairly serious way. So we ended up treating just 100 patients. That's all now done. And so we're 
literally doing the analysis of the results at this point. Okay. And you, you mentioned there about some of the benefits the patients um, experience, such as reduced pain. Were there any other benefits even from, from, the, from the first couple so of phases? So in the early phase trial, within 24 hours of receiving the cell treatment, most of the patients showed really quite a dramatic improvement in their pain scores. You know, there's, this, the, the, yes. the, there's these, these standardized pain scoring systems. Most of the patients showed a dramatic improvement in pain outcomes. And this was sustained for a year, at least a year following the treatment. So it wasn't just a, um, um, a you know, a placebo effect, we think, because it was sustained. Um, within a week of receiving the cell treatment, most of the patients, again, had improved knee function. Um, and again, this was sustained for the year um, that they were followed up. We didn't do any imaging of the joints. There's no x-rays or, or MRIs of the joints uh, um, in that phase one study. So we weren't able to see if there was actual repair of the mm. tissue, but at least in terms of the functional um, scoring, the, the results were quite good. In the phase two trial, there's very um, um, elaborate uh, imaging of the joints before and after the cell treatment. So when the results are disclosed, we will know if there was a regenerative or, or structural change associated with the treatment. And when do you when do you expect to or will it be publicly known, I suppose, the results will, of that phase, phase all, two? All be published. The results are literally being unblinded right now. You know that this, when the study is active, it's fully blinded. So the physicians and the patients don't know which whether the, which group they belonged mm -hmm. to. Uh, but in October, the six month time point uh, was reached after the last patient was treated. And so that's when the results are opened, analyzed, they're, they're reviewed and all put together. And so in the near future, in a matter of weeks, I think we'll know the, um, the results of that's a six month time point. And then, of course, the, the patients will be monitored up to two years after they receive the treatment. So um, we'll know both the short term and the long term outcome of the treatment. Okay, so certainly a very exciting point in the in the study. Very exciting, but also um, along the way, it turned just very recently. In fact, it turns out that a, a similar study was carried out in Australia, and that was just published in the last few weeks, and that also reported quite a positive outcome. So, based on another study, a completely separate, unrelated study done somewhere else, uh, where there's a positive outcome, I think we can be very optimistic that we'll also um, see a positive outcome. Okay, certainly very positive news. And then in terms of there is a third phase. So can you tell us a bit about what's going to happen yeah. and what time frame? So the way these clinical trials work is that you have to start off on a small scale. That's the phase one study. Mm -hmm. Then you do something that's a bit bigger, a phase two. And if the results of the phase two study are good, we go ahead and do a phase three study, which is much, much bigger, involving hundreds and hundreds of patients. And it's likely that the phase three trial will happen in the US. And um, I'm spending a lot of time in the US this year trying to uh, make arrangements for that phase three study to begin. And we've made quite a bit of progress. So the the plan is that the phase three study will involve 400 to 600 patients, maybe even more than that. Instead of them receiving their own cells, they'll receive cells from a donor. So instead of being an autologous, that is cells coming from the patient themselves, it'll be an allogeneic study where the cells come from a unmatched donor. That just makes it logistically much easier and it also makes it much cheaper to, to, to carry it out. So and was that the basis on which the first two phases were done? Was Were they first, were they from donor, uh, I suppose, donors other than the patient? No, the first two phases were the patient's own cells. So what happened in those two studies, the phase one and the phase two study, was the patients came in, they underwent a small liposuction, like an abdominal liposuction mm -hmm. and a small amount of fat tissue was taken from the abdomen, usually about 20 grams, quite a small amount. And then that fat tissue is sent to a processing, a cell processing facility and the cells are extracted and grown in culture. And then when the cells are all ready, they go back to the hospital and they're injected into the patient's knee joints. So in those two studies, the phase one and the phase two, the patients were receiving their own cells. But in the phase three, uh, the plan is that the patients won't receive their own cells. They'll, they'll receive donor cells. The reason for doing that is that, it, as I said, it's much logistically much easier and it's also um, much cheaper to prepare those cells from the from the donor rather than from the patient himself or herself. So is the phase three also about, you know, moving this study forward in terms of it being, you know, a realistic 
Absolutely. treatment possibility. The, uh, the, the hope is that when the phase three study is completed, we will then get approval to um, essentially launch the cell therapy product and make it available both in the US and in Europe. That's the that's the intention. That's that's what we hope. And that's the, the, the motivation for doing all of this is that eventually there will be this treatment available for, um, you know, large numbers of patients. And even though we focus only on the knee, of course, we also have our eye on, on um, uh, other joints, you know, the hip, the ankle and so on. Mm. Um, We've just focused our attention so far on the knee because. And why was that actually? Just as it's just easier. It's, it's easier, easier to deliver the cells into the knee joint than into other joints, and so um, that's that's really the only. I reason. suppose it's one of the main joints. And it is, of course, affected by osteoarthritis. It's one of the main joints. The hip. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly right. But but there is no reason to think that it wouldn't also work in other joints. Um, we just haven't been able to test that so far. So it certainly sounds really exciting uh, and certainly welcome news for many listeners who are living with osteoarthritis. Um, what sort of steps are involved after and what kind of time frames are, are involved in terms of, you know, I suppose the end point being a patient receiving this treatment? Um, so we'd have to do the phase three study. That's just that, that's the way it works. We, we have yeah. to do a study in a large group of patients that's highly controlled um, very sort of scientifically designed and very well controlled and very well carried out. We have to do that trial before we can go to the regulator, either in Europe or the US, and say, do you think these results are good enough and that the treatment is safe enough that we can now essentially make it available to the population in full, the patient population in full. And so the data would then be reviewed by a panel of experts who will look at it in, in sort of forensic detail and they look at every part of the results and every part of the conduct of the study. And if they're convinced, and the threshold for this is really quite high, but if they're convinced that there is a positive benefit, there is no adverse um, um, consequences, there's no risk to the patients, then we can get a market approval to uh, launch the product and make it widely available. So that's the bur the burden of proof then rests with us to show that it works, that it's safe and that it represents a, a reasonable benefit to, uh, the, to the patients. Um, we also have the challenge of how to then make the product in such a way that it's economically viable. Yes, I was going to ask you about yeah. that. So, I mean, a lot of these technologies, cell therapy and gene therapy, we hear a lot about nowadays, mm -hmm they tend to be incredibly expensive. And uh, for a condition such as osteoarthritis, which is so common, um, I think it only makes sense if the cost of the final product, the cost of the treatment is low enough for it to be widely available. So we have the challenge then of um, optimizing the manufacturing technology to make it highly efficient, cost effective, so that the final, the final uh, treatment is, you know, within a reasonable price range that it can be either supported by insurance companies or that individuals can pay for it themselves. Um, so we're talking about quite a small, quite a, quite a low cost for this to be uh, to work. There's no point in having a treatment available that works, but it's um, inaccessible because of cost. And maybe you don't know the answer to this at this point in time, but is it is the therapy something that would need a patient would need on an ongoing basis or is it envisaged that it would be a one off yeah. treatment? That's a very good question. Um, so far, all the work we've done has been on a single treatment only. There's no particular reason for that, except that's that that's um, uh, that's what we focused on. I would expect that patients would um, receive several repeat treatments throughout their lifetime. So if a person has, for example, early osteoarthritis, uh, they might receive a cell therapy injection. Then a few years later, they might receive it again and they might continue receiving it, you know, at intervals mm. throughout their life. And the so we're not talking about a homogenous group either. There's different absolutely. stages of disease. Yeah, of that. course. Yeah. But the whole objective here is that, number one, the patients will feel better. They, they won't have so much pain and they won't have so much disability. And number two is that they won't need that joint replacement surgery you know, for many more years that they'll that they'll they'll be able to um, um, live with functioning joints for for much longer than would otherwise be the case. So the need for the uh, knee replacement or the hip replacement surgery is put off by 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 years. That's 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 the ambition here. And therefore, 
reducing the need for further joint replacement Absolutely. Type of surgery when people are living longer now yeah. and they sometimes <coughs> have to go in for revisions. And, and yeah, the the risk associated with revision and and so on. So if if we can uh, do it in such a way that patients are much older when they receive that joint replacement, then I think we'll have succeeded. So I suppose, Frank, if I can finish by asking you this question, you know, what is your hope? for people living with osteoarthritis in relation to your research? So um, I think before I retire and sort of hang up my hat and give up this uh, <laughs> this business that I've been in for a very long time, what would give me the most satisfaction personally and professionally would be that there was a treatment which was going to be given to patients that made them feel better that I contributed in some way towards the development of. That to me would be... Um, uh, an achievement that I'd be very proud of. So what I do hope is that at the end of all of this, uh, we'll have something that works for those patients and something which is um, effective, you know, life altering for, for many people. That's uh, that's what I hope. And on that positive note, I, I'll uh, bid you farewell. And thank you so much for joining us, uh, Professor Frank Barry. Thank you very much. That's all from this episode of Inflammation Nation. Don't forget to subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify or Stitcher or as they always say, wherever you get your podcasts. For further information about arthritis, you can visit our website, arthritisireland.ie, or contact our helpline on 0818 252 846. See you next time. Inflammation Nation is supported by Pfizer.